Yeah, it's very inspiring to hear uh, to Liu Baocheng and Heidi Hatzel. And what is interesting, both of you refer to history. And I think that is one of the beauty of our uh, webinar here that uh, we cannot understand each other without really looking at the, at the historical roots. And I'd like to add a few things from, not only from a European perspective, but also a bit from a global ethical perspective as uh, globeethics.net has in its name, a global network of ethics and GAF, uh, the AGAPE uh, uh, reference means uh, to really uh, um, meet each other based on respect and and love in a in a specified meaning of uh, really empathy to each other, which is not easy. I like to uh, share a few screens, um, a few slides. Uh, do you? Uh, let me start from beginning. Um, can you uh, see it? Mm -hmm. yes. Okay. yes, yes, yes. Uh, so just uh, uh, a few reflections on, on that. Um, uh, first of all, uh, just five points um, in the limited time that we have uh, before we then uh, can deepen it in discussion. First of all, when we look at democracy, I'd like to remind us about the diversity of uh, of uh, political systems throughout history. And um, uh, we could say, start with, with the anarchy. There is no state. There is uh, just, uh, let's say, the, the stronger wins, um, either in form of no authority. And we, um, uh, we see that, especially in transition periods, uh, uh, Liu Baocheng referred to it as uh, in some uh, short periods in China, in the US, especially in this revolution uh, time when we switch from one system to another, um, there is somehow a lack of authority um, which, who decides. And then is it the weapons who decide, who, do, who, who decides? And then the so-called failed states, as we know it from uh, Somalia, for example, where you literally don't have uh, a government. And then, uh, of course, who is then the tribal uh, or the, the crooks or the, uh, the, the criminals who, de who rules um, uh, a geographic entity? The, <clears throat> Other is, um, I call it the all citizens model, uh, democracy, uh, direct democracy, representative democracy, parliamentary dem monarchy. I'm coming back to that in the new slide, uh, uh, in the next slide. But then we have, of course, uh, a model which is also widespread throughout history, especially also European history, the a cla ruling class of a few. Um, uh, today we speak about oligarchs. We speak mainly about oligarchs in terms of uh, financial, you know, superpower people, mainly men, a uh, few women. Um, uh, but oli oligarchy also in the sense of aristocracy. So you're you are born in a family, in a ruling family, and that is transcended. And throughout centuries in Europe, that was the case. The king, the uh, ships uh, a bit similar to what Leo uh, described, but there it is on a national level here it was sometimes all these small kingdoms were aristocrats who ruled. Plutocracy is then the, 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 the ruling of the, of the money. Technocracy also exists. We, we sometimes mm -hmm. call the government technocrats. It's not uh, fully correct because even they are uh, democratically uh, elected, but not by their political party color, but by their technical skills and, and knowledge. I had a chance to, to meet uh, uh, Victor uh, Klutko, Klitschko, the mayor of uh, Ukraine, who, of Kiev, who is now in, uh, every day in the media. I was in a conference and he's for me, uh, this kind of technocrat in a, in a, 
in a positive sense, but uh, he is a, a young, um, 40, 45 years old um, person, uh, agile, uh, this new generation of people uh, guiding through uh, technical skills. Um, kleptocracy is then those who steal the money of others and rule. And we, we have that somehow in, a, in, a, uh, in, in many countries too, uh, in Africa, but also in others, where then uh, you have uh, uh, minerals, you have mining, you have oil, and uh, you, you rule by the wealth of uh, what you uh, take. Gerontocracy would be uh, the, the older people, you know, that's why we have some rules, you should step back with 65 as a professor, or you should step back uh, as, a, as a governor with a certain age in order to allow renewal. But with an aging society, we see more and more, yeah, uh, Joe Biden, uh, uh, President Xi, um, and many other presidents of countries are now 70 plus or 75 plus. And we may see people who are 80 plus who are still at the, at the top of a state, which could not be imagined some, some years back. Uh, synar synarchy and theocracy as two other forms of oligarchy. Theocracy when, uh, the, so to say, the political ruler and uh, the divine ruler uh, uh, are together. And this also we have seen worldwide in many. We see it today in Iran to some extent, but we also saw it in history, uh, Augustus, uh, the, the, the Caesar of Rome, uh, ancient Rome, uh, saw himself also as the representative of the divine. Um, and uh, so this is a model which is uh, also very widespread in history. And then the, the monocracy, I call it, I mean, when we have one ruler, dictatorship, absolute monarchy, or again, theocracy. So this overview shows that we have a variety of uh, ruling systems. And the question now, when we concentrate on democracy, what kind of democracy uh, and uh, we call democracies in plural as the title of our webinar means. Now, I like to show uh, four types of uh, democracies and advantages and disadvantages very briefly. Um, we heard about, I start with the second representative democracy as very well and detailed described by Heidi Hatzel, the US system, but many other democracies, uh, France and many others, where uh, you vote for a representation and the representation is then ruling a country. And uh, another model, it's, uh, no, the second, yeah, is multi-party, citizens vote the parliament and uh, uh, that's possible for large countries because uh, uh, you uh, every province every uh, of the 50 states in the US can uh, vote and and uh, even though uh, US is a very large country it's possible uh, disadvantage somehow the limited uh, people's participation and with that I come back to the first one the di direct democracy where the people are not delegating a good part of their power but they keep it themselves in hand and that is a, uh, also multi-party I take Denmark uh, also Switzerland but I come back to Switzerland um, large people's participation the advantage of this large participation, but it's also demanding because normally it's only possible in small countries. Denmark is a small country, Switzerland is a small country, or you can have a direct democracy on a local level, a village, everybody can vote the mayor of the village or the school president or the pastor or whoever, uh, because everybody knows each other and it's a, an enlarged family which allows the direct democracy. But it's also somehow slow because everybody wants to have a say um, if you don't delegate to other levels. Now, the third one is the parliamentary monarchy. That's a kind of mixture. You have still a king or a monarch, but you have also a parliament. 
So the, and then it depends on how much power the monarch still has. It's, it can be almost a dictatorship or it can be uh, almost very close to a representative democracy. Um, so it's multi-party, can also be monoparty, uh, single party, then the monarchy with the parliament is the characteristic, combining of unifying authority and limited democracy. So it's an effort to balance the unity and Liu Bao Cheng emphasized the importance of unity in, uh, in the Chinese system. And almost every country has this fear of uh, losing unity. Uh, so the monarch has the task to guarantee unity while allowing some sort of representation. But there is also a disadvantage. The monarch normally has still the power uh, to dismiss the parliament. And then of course it can uh, shift into absolute absolutism, so to say. The fourth model is the Swiss model. I'm uh, coming from Switzerland. Uh, we call it the concordance democracy. It's multi-party, but the difference is that all main parties are represented in government. That means, for example, our government of seven uh, ministers um, uh, four different political parties are in the government. And that is complex. Uh, it, uh, it's peace, it's constant consensus. The government has to find each time a consensus for everything. We cannot say there is a majority party and they can with 51 to 49% rule. That's not possible in Switzerland. In each single thing, if we have masks or known masks in the bus, now during pandemic, the government has to come together, even though we have different views. And that is the, the, uh, the disadvantage, it's very slow. We, since 20 years, we struggle for a CO2 law, legislation, because the, everybody not, needs a, a compromise and to, to, to uh, look at each other. Uh, also a question if that is only possible for small countries. We have 8 million people. And when I'm in China, in Beijing, they tell me, yeah, that's just one, one uh, area of Beijing. That's one street of Beijing, 8 million people. So if you have 1.4 billion people or 3 billion, 1.3 like in China, or 1.4 like in India, can it be run on a concordance democracy? I would say most probably not because uh, it's too demanding for a large entity, but it's still possible on a small entity, on a village level. But the advantage, and that is one of the main reasons why Switzerland is seen as a very peaceful country, because it's very stable. We don't have this shift every four years where uh, the Republicans uh, replace the Democrats or the Democrats replace the Democ. Uh, and as we have it in Germany, in France, you see the current uh, elections. Um, they always switch between uh, left and right, so to say, or between the two main ruling parties. We never have that in Switzerland. And that is part of the stability. Now, let me look at the people's participation. At the center of all forms of democracy is the participation of people in decision making. And uh, both uh, former speakers, Heidi and uh, Bao Cheng, referred to that. The uh, China People's Republic, you are a republic of people huh? uh, in the title of the of the uh, of your system. And then uh, the the people. Uh, uh, concept uh, developed strongly in the US history for the people, with the people, by the people, uh, uh, based on this uh, uh, bottom up um, history of the US. The difference is how they participate, directly or indirectly, I just mentioned that. Direct democracy works mainly in small countries, uh, representative democracy also in large countries. The decisive is the power structure. 
uh, two party systems tend to polarization. And that's my problem I have really with democracy. This ping pong is somehow not only tiring and more and more people abstain from voting because they say it's always the same. We tend from one party to the other than four years back. Uh, uh, and uh, th that's not, it's demotivating somehow this kind of uh, polarization and also dangerous as we see in a number of democracies. Uh, people uh, get tired or they get uh, polarized and fight each other uh, in, a, in a very dangerous uh, way. The one party system allows mainly people's participation on lower and lo local level. And I'm thankful to CNI uh, uh, IE also, uh, the China Network for International Exchanges, the, and other um, groupings. I, I learned uh, in China that you have uh, people's participation in a direct way also on the village level. Uh, I think internationally many do not know it. So village level democracy, and I, I suggest that we learn more about that, how it works, what are the limits, and then you have a combination, that's my interpretation, and I invite you, uh, Jing Jing and Liu Bao Zheng, to comment on that in the discussion. My interpretation is that you have this people's participation more developed on the local level, and then a more unifying, uh, centralized uh, monarchy uh, type of uh, yeah, one party system. But th that's just one um, question. Um, how do we validate the size of a country in terms of uh, democracy and people's participation. Now, um, I, I'd like to add from a from a ethics perspective, what is very important for me is that the different values are uh, have to be seen together. On the left side, you see a tree, and we could say each big branch of a tree is a one core fundamental value. And on the right side you see of the slide, you see uh, 12 values, um, uh, sustainability, solidarity, community, justice, empowerment, responsibility, participation, freedom, security, peace. So participation in this system is one of the values. And we should not isolate it and say participation above all. Participation is meaningful if it leads to security, to stability, to peace, uh, to, to uh, uh, economic uh, well-being, uh, to uh, taking their responsibility and so on. But if it's exaggerated, participation is the only value, then it leads nowhere. So that is a bit my point that we should evaluate our systems and the other two speakers already referred to it. When we evaluate the political system, what does it contribute in terms of people's participation, in terms of peace, instead of fairness and justice, um, empowerment of men and women and, and poor and so on. So that's a bit my holistic su suggestion. And I developed it in a whole uh, big uh, book called Globalance. Uh, uh, published uh, two years ago. You will see the link, you can download it for free. And that leads me to the last slide, people's participation in direct and representative democracy, which exists around the world, strengthens human dignity, freedom of participation, productivity, and peace. And uh, Heidi Hatzel described it very well in, in the US case, the individual freedom uh, uh, is really at the core of this uh, development in the US. Local people's participation combined with strong central authority in large nations is, a, is an effort to balance dignity through participation with unity of the nation. Um, my third point, some cultures throughout history have not a tradition of people's participation, but strong belief in only authority and central power, which often violates human dignity. That's a disadvantage because is there any corrective measure if uh, an authority is not a good ruler, as we all hope, but a, a bad ruler, because every good ruler can turn into a bad ruler uh, by um, 
becoming authoritarian. So this is a challenge, I think, of this system. And Liu Bao Cheng, you, uh, you referred uh, very well. And I mean, you are the one of the best um, expert in really value system in China over 5,000 years, as you said. So you said, in, in fact, if I understood it well, uh, that there was always, except of a few short periods, decentralized uh, power with advantage and disadvantage. And uh, you believe in central authorities in order not to lose unity. So I think that is a big uh, chance and a big challenge. Uh, I would add also the so-called, I call it electronic democracy. Where there are new ways of people's participation and they are used. I mean, social media is a way of democracy um, in a, not in a formal way, but in an informal way. It allows modern form of people's participation, polls, signatures, social media, and so on. And I think it may be in the next uh, such webinar, we could focus on that. How is people's participation enlarged by social media? And that's why, of course, rulers like uh, the president of Russia at the moment uh, is then restricting social media to almost zero because they see the, the, this modern form of democracy, uh, electronic democracy, which is very powerful. Now, uh, looking at religious institutions is also interesting because Heidi mentioned the Protestants, very democratic, and here in Geneva, only uh, two kilometers from my office where I'm sitting here, John Calvin was in fact the first who developed church democracy. And then the, it was taken over by the state. And then it was taken over by the Protestants in Holland and then uh, in UK and then in US. So Geneva was to some extent, one of the sources of modern democracy uh, coming from a reformer, interesting. Uh, and but the majority of religious institutions like temples, monasteries, or Catholic church combine people's participation with a one party power. It means not a party in terms of political party, but the, the leader of a monastery, the leader of a temple, the leader of the bishop of a diocese and the Pope, they are all uh, part of a hierarchical uh, leadership, but then they still have people's participation, for example, in a parish. Now, uh, the last point I already mentioned, uh, democracy is slower but more stable than autocracy. Thank you so much.